coming to rescue. Now, this should have reminded the Israelites of certain things. It should have reminded the Israelites of their time in Egypt. When for 400 years, they were in bondage. It felt like forever. It felt like they would be in this for the rest of their existence. But God came. God came through and with a mighty hand brought the people of Israel out of Egypt. He proved his greatness. He proved his faithfulness to Abraham and the promises that he had made. As the messenger runs with these promises to Israel, and as they share it among each other, they should remember what it was like for them when they got into the land of Israel. How at the beginning, when Joshua and the other leaders were around, they were obedient to God. But then when Joshua died, and some of those other leaders died, they forsook the God that they were supposed to fear. Now, if you look up fear, and, and you try to get a definition of fear in the, in the dictionary or in the Bible, Bible commentary, it will say something like majestic awe or reverent awe or something like that. I want to give you a picture of the kind of fear. We just dealt with some tornadoes um, here in the Midwest. And I want you to, to think of a tornado. You're standing in the middle of a street. And in front of you, we had all the buildings and trees and cars that used to be there are gone. And coming towards you is this whirl of power heading directly towards you. It's covering up as much as you can see. It's about a mile wide and coming at you at about 70 miles an hour. The trees that were in the way are nothing but toothpicks. And the cars are crumpled up masses of metal and broken glass. Houses and buildings are bricks and pieces of wood. And it is coming toward you, and you know there's no place to run. You run to the left, you run to the right, you run behind you, it doesn't matter. Death is coming, and there's nothing you can do about it. You whisper a prayer, not for help, because right now nothing can help you. You whisper a prayer because you know that after a short moment of intense pain, you will be before God. You start to feel the winds whip on your clothing and on your faith. You feel like it's going to strip everything from you. And right as it gets to you, it seems to slow down, and there's a breeze, and it picks you up. It picks you up and doesn't twist you in pieces, and you're wondering what's going on, because the feeling that you have is like what you would have ex expected when your mother was holding you as a toddler. And you are in this thing, and you're seeing the the, the, what was cars and what was buildings and what was people, but you're safe. And this tornado veers off path, goes over to the left, slowly and gently places you on a hilltop. After it places you on that hilltop, it starts moving away again, 
and you feel the power of it start up again. And the winds whipping at 350 miles an hour or something like that and going back to its original place. You can look to the left and see that what was once a city is now nothing but clear ground. Everything obliterated. It goes back to where it picked you up and continues on its path of complete destruction. What you're feeling at that point point is the fear of God. You're beginning to feel the fear of God. And that's what the Israelites were supposed to have. They were supposed to recognize that the most creative and destructive force of the universe was their rescue and help and hope, and that there was nothing that could prevent their destruction except the one who could potentially destroy them. That's what they were supposed to feel. That's what they were supposed to know. And yet, they turned to pieces of stone and wood and bowed down to it. And God wasn't having that. And so, over and over and over, you see in the scripture, you see in Judges, that the Lord would allow nations to come in and for decades hold the people of Israel under their thumb until they remembered God. Until they repented and sought God for salvation. And when they did, he came as a rescuer and got them out of their hands. In love, he rescued them. And in joy, they praised him until they forgot again. And they would do it over and over. When the vision of Habakkuk would have come to the people, as people would, would run and share it with them and they would share it with each other, they should have been reminded of this history and reminded that though it linger, it is coming. The rescue is coming because he promised and God never broke a promise. They should have remembered their history and that's why this was given so that the people who are writing Psalm 80 would remember God promised. Habakkuk wrote it years ago. We can trust that he's coming. God had a plan. God had a plan. And so we could trust in that plan. Scripture says this. Psalm 112, 7. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. Because you've got a promise. Proverbs 16, 20, whoever gives thought to the word, what was written, what was written for you over millennia, whoever gives thought to the word will discover good. And blessed is he who trusts the Lord. Amen. So that was trust in God's plan to proclaim and endure with expectation. Now we come to trust in pedigree, a warning against insidious imposters. It says this, and this is to or about the Babylonians. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. See, these Babylonians, they knew exactly who they were. At that time, they were the most powerful nation that anybody had ever seen. Everyone feared them. As Habakkuk 
would have written earlier in the passage in chapter 1, their horses are fast like leopards. They are powerful people. Every nation is afraid of them. And so the Babylonians knew their pedigree. They were warriors with power. They knew that they could trust their might to solve any problem. As a people, they were unstoppable. With power like this, they could never fail. They could put their trust in their own history of conquest. They had a reason to be proud. Or so they thought. What they didn't recognize is that unlike their god Marduk or Bel, who that they would go and worship, and they could go out and dance and do all kinds of stuff and talk about how great they are, and Bel wouldn't care, there's a god in heaven who cares. There's a god in heaven who says, my glory I will not give another. There's a God in heaven who says, there is no one who should be able to take my place as God. You see, the people of Babylon were imposter gods. They stood and said, praise me. And they went to all of the other nations and said, you could have trust your God. I'm going to destroy you. You praise me. And that's what they said over and over and over until the point they couldn't say it anymore because they recognized that they were no longer in power. Because the God of power, the God of glory took that all away from them. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 5 says this. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. It also says this, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech, I hate. Now, here's the question. Here's the interesting thing. Who gave Babylon its power? You can answer. God. God, Babylon would have no power except for God. Now, they could have worshipped God because of that power, but they chose to worship themselves. And oftentimes we are in just the same position. We look at our pedigree. They looked at their pedigree of, of being warriors, of a history, of conquering nations. And we look at our pedigree of our ethnicity, or of our education, or of our profession, or of our abilities. And those things are good. I thank God that I'm a black guy. I love being a black guy. Praise God that I'm a black guy, <laughs> right? But you can say the same thing. Praise God that I'm a white woman or praise God that I'm a Latino guy. Whatever you are, praise God. God has created beauty in the variety of the ways that we look or the abilities of we, that we have or the education that we have or the, the, the things that we can do or even the things that we can't do. God has created beauty in all of it and in all of the things that we have and in all of our pedigree. We can say praise God. We can glorify God for it. Or we can say, look at me. I got it together. I'm the boss. I'm the man. Seriously? We just read God is gonna, God's going to judge that. God is going to judge that. He created all of the wonderful things that we can see and experience in each other, 
for us to look at him and say, oh God, you are amazing. Look at all the beauty that you have created. I stand here and I look out and I praise God for all of the beauty that I see in front of me. I'm not going to go up to you and say, man, you should be God because you're so great. <laughs> no, I look at God and say, God, this is beautiful. You are so great because you've created all of these beautiful people in front of me with all of their talents and abilities so that your name could be glorified in Rockford, so that there could be a place of light where people can come and see how we work together to glorify your name. That's what you are here for. That's what your gifts and talents and abilities are for. Your pedigree should be a point of praise. Glorify God for your pedigree. Don't trust in it. So as we looked at pedigree, we look at trust in God's preservation. Trust in God's preservation, which is a revelation of salvation's source. It's a revelation of of salvation's source and it's that one little line that one little line in habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 the second part of it and it says but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness the righteous person will live by his faithfulness now, I struggled with this one a little bit, and, and here's why. Usually when I, I, I saw that passage, and I, I, I've seen it in, in, in my Bible and in King James Version and all that kind of stuff, it would say, the just will live by faith. And this one says, that the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. And that, it's like, what? Their faithfulness? They got to trust in themselves and their ability to, to kind of hold on to what they need to do in order to live? God, I got no faithfulness. I can't survive by my faithfulness. And, and goodness, these are the Israelites. We know their history. They're not going to live by any faithfulness. How's that even going to work? And, and so I looked. I said, this has got to be wrong. Like I looked up the Hebrew and stuff like that, and it's like, no, nope, no, nope, it, it really does say faithfulness. Um, there's, there's a, you, you can look down in the Bible and it says, or faith, but the, it really was faithfulness. I'm like, what am I going to do with that? You know, I had to start thinking about it. And ask the question, why is anyone ever faithful to God. Why is anyone ever faithful to God? Because faith, being faithful, it's, it's an attribute of the person who has it. It says that the person is dependable and will maintain his or her commitments to something or, or someone. Faithfulness has an object. So who is it going to be faithful to? It's going to be faithful to God. But it, also, if you look in the passage, it says that if you look at two and three, they, they've got to be faithful to the vision, right? They've got to be faithful to this vision. But the vision says that we, and we're not, we haven't gotten to the vision yet, but the vision, in order for the vision to be true, the one who gave the vision has got to be true, right? In order for the vision to be true, the one who said that this is going to happen has to be around in order to make sure that it happens, right? And so, if I'm faithful to the vision, then I've got to be faithful to the God of the vision. And if I'm faithful to the God of the vision, I've got to be able to say, this God who gave this vision, he's got to be able to actually make it happen. I've got to trust him for 
any of my faithfulness to make sense. So my faithfulness has got to be in His faithfulness. My faithfulness has to be in His faithfulness. And if my faithfulness is in His faithfulness, then I have faith in Him. So the just will live by their faithfulness to the one who is faithful. And so the just shall live by faith in God. Like, okay, I don't have to trust in me. I don't have to trust in me. I trust in Him. And I trust in Him to do the work to make me who I'm supposed to be. So the the just will live by their faith. And what is faith? What really is faith? A lot of people walk around talking about, they have faith, I have faith, I have faith, I have faith, I believe. What's that all about? If you go mountain climbing, a lot of times you'll have to put a rope onto something and bang a spike into that rock or whatever you're holding on to in order to make sure that if you fall, you'll be okay. I'm sure you've all seen movies of somebody hanging on and standing on a ledge and they've got their rope onto their rock and then the ledge falls away and then they're just there dangling. Right? They're dangling, onto, holding onto that rope. See, that rope, that tether, is kind of like your faith. Right? But that tether has to be attached to something. If you attach it to the wrong rock, you got a problem. Right? Faith is tethering yourself to something or someone because you are confident that they can hold you. It is not just something airy-fairy out there. It has an object. And the object of your faith determines whether you will be firm or you will fall. We must have our confidence in something or someone that will never fail. And there are a lot of those things out there, right? There are a ton of things that will never fall or fail, right? No. There's only one. Everything else will, can and will fail you. There is only one you can tether yourself to and know that when the ledge falls from under your feet that you are solid. That is God. There is none else. There is no other one. And so, we understand, we get faithful. We understand what faithful is. Faithfulness To God depends on having faith in God. And having faith in God means I tether myself to God because I know that he will never fail. Jeremiah chapter 39 verse 18 says this. For I will surely save you and you shall not fall by the sword, but you shall have your life as a prize of war because you have put your trust in me, declares the Lord. Jeremiah said this to a man called Ebed Melech. He was an Ethiopian, a man who trusted in Jeremiah's words regarding the Babylonians and therefore acted faithfully by protecting Jeremiah. And then we'll look at some other scripture of faith in God. Psalm 9, 10, it says, And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Psalm 22, 4, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. 
I also want to tell you one more thing about faith, right? There's one more thing. Faith is not, as some people say, believing when you have no proof. If that's your faith, I'm sorry for you. Your faith as a believer should be, I trust because I have experience. See this verse right here? In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. And so you can say, they trusted you, and you delivered them, I can trust you. I will trust you. And we've seen it throughout Scripture. God has proven who He is over and over and over and over. We trust Him. And so now that we've got faith, then how do we live by faith? We're kind of going backwards. The just shall live by faith. We've got faith. How are we going to live by faith? And that story, and that, what, I, what I just uh, I, I mentioned that, um, in Jeremiah about Ebed-Melech, and we're going to read that again. But one of the best stories, one of the best narratives that I know of in Scripture about living by faith has to do with something that happened with Moses. Uh, it's found in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. Let's read that together. It'll be on the screen. Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. It says this. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. These are the people that are supposed to be faithful. right? These are the people that are supposed to know how to fear God. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. By the way, the worthless food that they loathed was the food and bread from heaven that God sent down to them. Right? They hated this worthless food. Heavenly gift. Worthless food. Verse 6. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Okay. So really weird story. I grant you that. It's a really unusual story, but Jesus even talks about it himself. Situation is people being bitten by snakes and dying. And all they have to do is to look at another snake on a pole and they would live. Now, if I were there and I'm being bitten by snakes, I, I, I don't know if I would have the faith to just to look up at this bronze serpent. I, I, I don't know. I'd be more concerned about looking at myself like, I'm going to die. And it really hurts. Right? But all they had to do was look. And they would live. What they had to do was look and live. They needed to take their eyes off of their situation and focus, pay attention to something completely different. 
They had to take their eyes off of themselves and say, I will look to this thing that God said. And then they would live. It's a really unusual thing. But then Jesus takes that story for himself and said, like the serpent that Moses lifted up in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up, and I will draw all people unto me. And the same thing that was true of that bronze serpent is true of Jesus, that we look and we live. Now, it doesn't take a lot of effort to look, does it? It's not a hard thing to turn your attention to something else, typically. But if you are walking on water and waves are clashing around you, sometimes you take your eye off the prize. Right? You remember Peter? If it's you, Lord, let me come out and walk with you. And he's looking at Jesus, and Jesus says, yeah, come on. Gets out of the boat, and he's walking on water. How cool is that? He's looking at Jesus, and he's walking on water. But I don't know if it was a splash of water that got in his face or some kind of howling of wind that took his attention. But he turned and looked away and started getting scared, took his eyes off of Jesus and began to sink. But he did the wise thing. Lord, save me. And looked at Jesus again. And Jesus saved him. But both of these stories talk about what it means to look and live. It's living by faith, turning your eyes off of you and your problems and your situation and looking at the only one who can save you from them. It feels like it shouldn't be hard, but it is. Because we always want to look at our situation and complain to somebody about our situation and over and over think about what's happening, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong. When God calls us to look at Jesus, when God calls us to look to our salvation, when God calls us to have faith in Him, God calls us to look in His direction. But by looking, by looking, we are saved. By looking, we have salvation. It is only as we look at God that we can be saved. So living does come through faith. Isaiah chapter 12, verses 2, behold. And behold means extended looking. Behold, I'm calling you to pay attention. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust. And even though the storm is raging around me, I will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song. I can sing in the middle of storms because God is there. And He has become my salvation. And once again, Jeremiah 13, 18, For I will surely save you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but you shall have your life as a prize of war, because you have put your trust in me, declares the Lord. It's easy for our focus to be taken, but remember who your God is Remember the image of the powerful tornado. There is nothing and no one that can stand in his way. Look at the greater power. 
And now we get to, we got to faith and living by faith. Now we get to righteousness by faith. The righteous person shall live by his faith. One of the big concerns that we have with this passage and this glorious statement and so many other parts of Scripture that talks about the righteous person, talks about the righteous person, talks about the righteous person, is that that's not me. I am a sinful person and I know it. So if I was in this situation and God says to me, the righteous person shall live by his faith, I'm not getting saved because I am not righteous. How did the Israelites who were considered righteous get their righteousness? Well, there was a specific day of atonement, right? Where they would go and they would sacrifice their animals. The high priest would go in and he would take their blood before the altar. He would ca- take the blood and, and uh, f- for himself first and then for the people. And then he would sprinkle them with water and he would say, you are clean, you are clean, you are clean. And they're like, I got my righteousness. I am pure before God. Now here's the question. Getting wet with bloody water make you righteous? Really? Getting wet with bloody water and, 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 and blood poured over an altar, is that really g- going to make you righteous? God even said, look, man, I am tired of your sacrifices. I am tired of your bulls and goats. And in the New Testament, it says the blood of bulls and goats, that's not going to make you righteous. They had to actually trust in the God who created these things. They had to trust in the God who created these rituals in order to make them righteous. That bloody water wasn't going to do anything. Trusting in Jesus, trusting in God for those people was the only thing that really made them righteous. And then, based on the righteousness that God said that they have, then going out and living it by, by His power, by His Spirit. And, of course, you know, again, we talk about the cycle. That didn't last very long. But they would go and trust that the rituals that God set up would make them righteous. Righteousness has always been through faith. It has never been because of those, that, those sacrifices of bulls and goats. It has always been through faith. It's in trust in God and not by what we do that any of us can ever be made righteous. One of the stories that gets used in the New Testament comes from Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. It says this, and he, Abraham, believed the Lord and count, and it counted to him as righteousness. Romans 5 says this, and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. If you're one who trusts in Jesus, then by definition, you are righteous. You can see yourself in all of the Old Testament scripture that speak of righteousness because you have the righteousness of Christ. And that comes by faith. And so we get to the whole passage, the righteous shall live by faith. This passage is used in the New Testament to show that our righteousness, justification, and salvation are all and only obtained by faith in God. Romans 1, 16 to 17 says this, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. 
And Galatians 3.11, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. By faith you live, by faith you become righteous. This is a thread that runs throughout Scripture that everything that you need spiritually can only come from the work of God that you hold on to and not your own works. There's trust in possessions as well. That's also seen here. Won't spend too much time on this. But it's a condemnation of treasonous traitors. It says this, Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest. Because he is as greedy as the grave and death is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the people. The Babylonians, in celebration or what, would take on wine and drink wine and enjoy wine. But Proverbs 20 says, wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. And yet, and you'll read, and as Pastor Dave will teach, you'll see that wine became, would become part of their downfall as well. Or it could be wealth. They had lots of stuff. There was a lot of stuff that they had. They, they captured everything. They were taking people's wealth and taking people, making them slaves. Could they trust in that? They might have. But Scripture says this. In Proverbs 11.28, Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. And they also trusted in their idols that they made out of gold and silver and so on. Their cities were impregnable because their God, Bel, was able to hold on to them. But scripture says this in Jeremiah 51, 44, And I will punish Bel in Babylon and take out of his mouth what he swallowed. The nation shall no longer flow to him. The wall of Babylon has fallen. They could not trust in any of those things. In the end... There are only two things that we can build our lives on. It is either the creator or his creation. There's nothing else. It's either the creator or his creation. And this is in conclusion. Now the choice may seem obvious. Right? The choice might seem obvious. We can tether ourselves to the creator who is the only constant in the universe everything else will fall everything else will fall there's a passage that i'm kind of stealing from pastor dave because it's coming up later uh, in the book of habakkuk Habakkuk, right close to the end. And, uh, oh, the slide is the conclusion. Just jump to the end, right. It says, Though the, tree, the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. If you trust in God, if you put your faith and hope in God and not in his creation, this can be true of you. But if... You're putting your trust in creation? When the fig tree fails and you're tethered to that fig tree, you're failing along with it. When there's nothing in the barn and there's no money in the bank account, you are falling along with that. Tether yourself to the only one in the universe that will hold fast no matter what storm is coming. The purpose of creation is to be a lens 
through which we look and say the creator is awesome. But if we tie ourselves to it, we fall right along with it. Tether yourselves to Jesus. I'm gonna, my brother Lenny, he's going to come and he's going to share his testimony with us. I'll grab oh. So awesome to have you here, Lenny. Oh, God, that's so good. I thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm really nervous right now, so just pray for me. Um, when I grew up, I was I one of nine children, and I also had cerebral palsy. That just means that when I was born, that means my I wasn't getting the oxygen to my brain, but that didn't stop me. Um, when I was 11, I lost my mom, and that caused me to act, to act out. Drinking, smoking, I probably smoked more weed than anybody should have. <laughs> <laughs> and then I began to drink. My favorite drink was Coke and Hennessy. You probably didn't see me nowhere without that. Mm. And then I in high school, and I began to sleep with girls just for something to do. But my mom was always saying, "Plead the blood. You know? Just keep God in your pocket." <laughs> and I began to just sleep with people for something to do. Then. I messed around and got a DUI. Driving on the wrong side of the road, drunk as I could be. <laughs> mm. Oh God, it was really a journey. Then I moved from Chicago to Rock Falls. Not thinking that I was gonna fall in love with anybody, but I did. <laughs> And I get married. Is that on? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought this was on. All this I time. did too. <laughs> and I, I um, get married. I can say that that was, a, was the love of my life. <clears throat> but then she died of cancer, of cancer. But God will keep you if you want to be kept. Um, I stand before you as... I graduated at Rock Valley, <clears throat> and now I'm working on my bachelor's. God been so good. Amen. He has been more to me than I could ever be to myself. Thank you, God. Amen. And it's, you just got to keep your hand in God's hand. But most of all, I thank God for my mom. God bless the praying woman. Mm. She's... At eight years old, and we call her blessed. Because mm. she loved me when I thought nobody else did. Mm. She's just wonderful. And lastly, I thank God for what this church means to me. And I would have to thank God for every fish, because he's always pouring pour into who I am. Mm. <clears throat> and I know this person don't know what he means to me, but I see him right there. Mario, <laughs> yeah. he gets up and we want to say, let's pray. And I thank you for that because sometimes I ain't ready. <laughs> but one thing about Mario, he don't get you ready or not. He, 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 he just going to do it. Do what the guy do. And most of all, I thank God for it, <clears throat> for Myra, because the prayer ministry means so much to me. Mm. It's blessed my life in so many ways, and I thank you for the opportunity. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Yeah.
sometimes like the people of Babylon. We might hold on to things that are not worth holding on to, whether it's sex or drugs or possessions like they did. But what do we place our hope in? What is our hope? Now, question, we can ask the question, what is hope, right? We, we, it's a word that we toss around all the time. We can have, have hope that uh, a certain football team that will remain nameless <laughs> will actually win the Super Bowl this year. That's, that's lost hope. <laughs> I, I did not mention any names, <laughs> right? But hope is the eager expectation that something will occur, right? You just, it could be anything, you just something will occur. Habakkuk had hope, but he didn't just have hope, he had godly hope. And godly hope is different from just hope, because godly hope is the eager and unwavering expectation that God's promises will occur based on the character and sovereignty of God and empowerment by the Holy Spirit. So it's not just the hope that you see on the screen. There's godly hope. But we have more than even just godly hope. We have Christian hope. And Christian hope is even better because Christian hope is that that eager and unwavering expectation that God's promises will occur, they're not just based on the character and sovereignty of God, which is overwhelming already. It is also based on the finished work of Christ. Wow! We can hold on. And we're also empowered by the Holy Spirit to hold on. Now, I know you look at this and some of you might have some concerns because this unwavering expectation, it's like, man, my expectation wavers all the time. It wavers all the time. But it's kind of like the sun. Even at nighttime, the sun is still there. Even on a cloudy days, the sun is still there. That expectation is based on you looking at Jesus. Continue to look at Jesus. Look at Jesus and be transformed as you look. And tether everything in your life to him. And you will be called righteous forever. And you will live forever because your hope and trust is grounded on something, someone, immovable. The righteous will live by faith.